Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the SAMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of the seminar series is, as always, to bring the community together. The seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. They are also available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel. If you haven't seen some of our excellent seminar speakers from the past, please do check them out. Again, they are all available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel. We also have some great speakers planned for the upcoming months, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Before we get started, a few quick acknowledgments. First, Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and two CMCC students without whom the seminar would not happen, Katie Floyd and Ryan Kwok. Please do continue to follow us both on the um, YouTube channel and other resources. We look forward to continuing to share our updates with you. A few quick notes before we get started. Reminder that the webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions for the speaker, please email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or you can paste them directly into the YouTube channel chat. Either way, they will be propagated to the speaker at the end of the seminar. Finally, it's my pleasure today to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Richard Blair. Dr. Blair received his PhD from UCLA in materials chemistry. He did a brief, brief postdoc at a small SBIR company, Eltron Research, and then a postdoc at Jet Propulsion Lab. At JPL, he was introduced to mechanochemistry and decided that moving to academia was best to pursue work in this field. He joined the University of Central Florida in 2007 as a chemistry assistant professor and developed quite a bit of chemistry and IP around mechanochemical and forensic identification methods. He produced the first ever revenue gen generating IP in the chemistry department for technology enabled feedstock agnostic conversion of biomass to simple sugars for the production of biofuels using a mechanochemical process. Dr. Blair then moved to a research faculty position and began working on a pilot, pilot plant as the director of ECK Laboratories. In parallel, he worked with Garmore to develop a scaled and greener method of pr producing partially oxidized graphene and graphite products. Dr. Blair co-founded IDEM Systems to develop and market a new law enforcement tool for the identification and tracking of controlled substances. Dr. Blair is a 2022 inductee into the National Academy of Inventors. Today, it is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Bear Blair to the mechanochemistry discussions. Okay, good morning uh, or afternoon, wherever you are or when you're watching this. Uh, I'm gonna present today on uh, actually looking at what's going on in uh, mechanochemical processes. Uh, not, not necessarily chemically, but physically, the imp how we can look at the impacts and look at the forces involved and use that hopefully to do something uh, predictive or useful. Uh, just as a little aside, the, my front title page here is actually the front end visually looking at the uh, motion of media in a very large mill. I think this one was 160 liter volume. So uh, you can see actually there's a dead space here where the media is not moving. That's bad. Uh, why are we doing this? So um, I'm showing here, um, we want to turn mechanochemistry from a, an oddity or people like to say, oh, look, we, we put this in a ball mill and we made, we got 100% yield. Um, okay, that's great. You did it in the laboratory scale, but we want to move it into an engineering tool. And when you go to an engineering tool, there's things that they make called process uh, block flow diagrams. So this would be the mass in, energy in, your transport of uh, material, so you have inputs of power, heat, cooling, reaction rate. You can see the little arrow is moving. Um, and outputs of the heat that's produced and the product. So you can know how much tons per day you can process. So this um, uses uh, packages like Aspen or ChemCAD um, to build these up and then get what's called a mass balance, energy balance uh, for building a plant or scaling up a process. If we look at the little dotted area for a, a, a mill, that unit doesn't exist for these kind of packages. We really like to start putting together, building a, the rules or the, the code for that kind of unit. So chemical engineers can go and say, okay, we're gonna add a mechanochemical process and we know we can put this unit in and we know our mass in and mass out. In order to get to that step, we have to understand what's going on at the very, at the microscopic fundamental levels so that we can project it up to the larger level. 
So we need fundamental, as Deborah always will say, we need fundamental understanding for predictive capability. There you go. So the very first uh, step one might take in fundamental understanding is abstracting the uh, in itself is looking at models. And so uh, in engineering, you might have something called a finite element method. So that's uh, used flow. And there's another method called discrete element method. The discrete element method is particularly useful for looking at milling, uh, especially ball milling, because you can model the part of the, uh, the media moving around in respect to the motion of the container. Now, industrially, one might not use these kind of shaking ones that we use more static. I'm going to show you in the next slide a larger version of this. If you're watching and you're a laboratory researcher, you might be familiar with a couple of these. You have the Retch mill. It's very popular in Europe, form pet scientific, which is very similar motion to the Retch mill. And Specs, which is now Cole Palmer, um, is very popular, less so. And I'm going to give you some reasons why we use those over the uh, form pick ones. Mostly it's because of inertia. I have a bunch of them, and purchasing more is not necessarily the best. What we can see on these, what's interesting, is we can see the motion of the media. And we can get some idea of the compressive forces that are occurring when the media hits the balls and where the majority of the force is occurring. So we can start designing, we're looking at what does the reactor design do to yields, how can the reactor design be extrapolated to larger sizes? And so with the same type of model, so these models are very simple. They're three, three this is tracking two balls on the left, and tracking three balls on the right. So they're not quite computationally intensive. If we get to a much larger scale, so this is a 160 liter simulation, I think the time, this one took a week to, uh, to run. Uh, we can, and this is something to be more relevant to an industrial scale, so this is, large amounts of media um, that can be done either in continuous, you can flow in reactants, or you can do it in batch mode. Um, ideally, you'd like a continuous mode. But the question is, how does one go from those small specs and wretch type or even form tech type uh, vials to something this big, especially if you, and that, this is like a pre-pilot scale. So you're not even getting to a point of producing something. So you start making, you say, okay, what, what kind of handle can we get on this? So we can look at these and we can measure compressive force, we can measure kinetic energy, we can actually calculate that from the model. Um, and we can start binning it. So we can look at compressive force. If you look on the right, we have the compressive forces for um, a variety of type of mills. We have planetary mill going up in scale. So you can see it goes to 1.4 liter. This is still laboratory type scale of a very large lab. We have one of these in my lab. We do like 500 grams at a time. We usually do 100. That's a lot to generate one experiment. So you really have to want to make that uh, to four liter, to 28 liter. And then uh, these kind of get outside of a laboratory and not quite pot plant, but pilot, a uh, pre-pilot plant. So uh, there, you know, there's a way to get a handle on it. We can start seeing some trends, but that still doesn't tell us what, what really the, the deficiency is here because this was computationally intensive. And this just tells us going out the media. Once we start loading it, so let's say we have a liquid in there, let's say we have powder in there, we don't really know how much energy is being transferred to that powder. We know how much energy would be transferred in there if there's nothing in there, but not if there's if there's a actual reactant in there. So although this is a good handle, this isn't really at indicative of what's going on in a process. Now, if we look at these, we go take a step back and we think about the impact models. Uh, so in a DEM, a discrete element simulation, your default your default impact model is a Hertzian model. So the impact uh, causes deformation uh, of the surface. And that deformation, if you want to think in terms of chemistry or solid state chemistry or mechanical alloying, in the surface it's going to induce defects, um, which are going to be active. It's going to scrape off any oxide layer. Um, if you have liquid compounds, the liquid is going to get compressed between the ball and the material and then kind of get squished into it. So we have lots of pathways for, for chemistry to happen. Um, and when we look at this little cartoon here, you know, we, I show the surface being deformed, but actually both are slightly deformed. Um, I, we obviously try to choose very hard balls so we don't get our balls to be all worn, but anybody that's done a lot of ball milling will notice the balls do eventually uh, wear away as does your uh, your surface. So, but what we're interested in again is the material, although this is great in terms of talking about impacts, the kinetic energy of the impact, how much uh, 
uh, energy is going into the deformation of the surface of the fall, we really don't know how much energy is going into the reagents or how many, how much, how are the reagents getting trapped in there? So when we start talking about mechanochemistry, you say, well, this is a good start, but this is by no means the end. Um, and so if we want to look at these, just the forces, we need to know something called the coefficient of restitution. So the coefficient of restitution, we get to the next slide, I'll show you what's going on there. And we need to know the elastic moduli. So for a lot of materials that we study, we know the elastic moduli of the media on the surface, because these are standard steels or aluminum oxide or zirconium oxide. Um, but when you start adding reactants in there, so if we start doing organic compounds, your elastic moduli is really like almost nothing. It's, it's the liquid they absorb or they're waxy. Um, and so those reactants are really strongly perturbing this uh, process. Um, if we look at the, and even the coefficient of restitution. So if we talk about what the coefficient of restitution is, we can do these, this is a high speed experiment that was done in my lab. We're actually looking at the uh, coefficient of restitution of silver on silver, because we could not find that, so we had to measure it. So this was uh, taken at a thousand uh, frames per second. And essentially it's the ratio, if you look at this drop test, it's the ratio of the recoil height, let's see if we still can do, there we go. The recoil height to the starting height, or the recoil velocity to impact velocity. What that tells you is how much energy of that impact went into deformation of materials. And if we think about that, the deformation of the material, you know, some energy is going to go into heat, some energy is going to go into surface energy. And when you have uh, reagents in there, some energy is going to go into the reagents. Um, and uh, less coefficient restitution, well, if you get too low, most of it goes to the deformation. Uh, we really would like a quite high, uh, high coefficient restitution, close to one, so that we anything energy that's getting imparted, we can get it into the reagents. So you can look this up for a variety of materials. We know hard, and I picked some that are, might be used for bone mills. So hardened steel is used a lot, 0.817. PTFE, uh, organic chemists might use, might use a PTFE vial. 0.602. So actually, a lot of energy is getting lost to the deformation of uh, Teflon, and it it does speak to the um, the versatility of mechanochemistry and um, how organic chemistry is very uh, use is very um, enabled by it that PTFE type uh, bone mills can actually get chemistry to occur. I come from a solid state background, and so for me. Uh, I actually tend to over mill things. I don't use PTFE, I might use steel. And we'll let, if we put organics in there, I destroy it. I'm a terrible organic chemist. I'm a good inorganic chemist, but uh, just need to do a paradigm shift. We all have our little uh, things that we're good at. Um, but that's something to notice as well is that this uh, coefficient of restitution is velocity dependent. So although we can measure this in a drop test, that is not necessarily what's going on during milling because that ball, the ball in a, in a mechanically agitated ball mill is going much faster than terminal velocity. So what can we do? Uh, well, one is we'd like to see what's going on in these impacts, we'd like to see what the chemistry is going on. And I'm gonna bring this up, everybody points this out, but if you haven't seen it, you should look this up. It's very difficult to measure chemistry or look at impacts while you're, in a, while you're using a ball mill because the, the whole thing is moving around. It's a dynamic system and your impacts occur on a few milliseconds to microseconds. And so doing an experiment where you don't know where the impact's going to be, and you don't know the duration of the impact, makes it very difficult to do spectroscopic measurements or very careful measurements. Now, Thomas Lafristic at the Birmingham, Uni at Birmingham University, and over 10 years ago, figured out how to actually look at phase composition during milling. Now that's telling you the overall phase composition in the mill, it's not necessarily telling you what's going on at each moment of impact, but it's a good step forward. And it actually showed that there is uh, chemical processes occurring during ball milling that are not occurring in regular surfaces. So this really opened the way to looking, trying to look at what's going on during ball mills. So again, we can move this from a, a, a novelty to a actual tool. Now in my lab, um, this is an example we have of where we can visualize. Uh, you saw on the very first slide, we actually had the, we had the, the giant ball mill running at a very small scale. Um, for example, here I'm showing an agitated plug flow. So we have a plug flow reactor, so we do a catalytic reaction. One might ask, can you use mechanochemistry to enhance the catalysis? Um, Ferdy Schuth at uh, uh, 
uh, Max Planck Institute in Mulheim uh, does a lot of work with that. We have some very interesting ammonia synthesis work. And here we have a vibratory table that is uh, has a motor on an eccentric. And it likes to just go once. As motor on an eccentric is vibrating it. But OK, and we have a, a transparent window so we can see what's going on. So if we look here, um, if we run it at th about 300 hertz, we can see now it basically looks like a fluidized bed, and we can actually measure the displacement, and we can get an idea of the velocity of these particles. Now, this is done at 1,000 frames per second. Um, I actually can probably do it at a colleague who has a higher speed one and probably do it much uh, faster now. If we go too fast, we get resonance where you don't get the agitation. So that's interesting behavior that may have been predicted by discrete element modeling. So we could have uh, run this simulation and compared it to the actual data. Um, but again, we're just visually looking at motion, right? We have no idea. We can, we can calculate and infer what the impact um, energies are. But the moment we pack this with some catalyst or we, pack, or we coat the, uh, the media with something, uh, it's all going to change. So we, you know, motivated, you know, we want to look at what's going on at the moment of impact. And, and the, the first thing to think about is can we measure the duration and force of an impact with much more accuracy than just looking at it visually? Um, and something that immediately comes, and this is what's quite pot is quite popular in mechanical chemistry now, is implementing using piezoelectricity to do that. So Piezoelectricity, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, is the development of a potential across the material on the application of force. So if you compress or uh, material or distort it, that causes a distortion of the crystal lattice, which causes um, separation of charge, which can then cause potential to be developed. If you have an inorganic solid, a favorite piezoelectric material is barium titanate, BATAO3, and that structure is up there. It Although it looks symmetric now, it's a little bit tilted. So it doesn't have a center of symmetry, which is required for a, a material to exhibit phase electricity. But it's quite brittle. And I'm going to show you some problems with that. Now, some people have put barium titanite into, react, into chemical, mechanical chemical reactions and gotten uh, redox chemistry to occur. Now, that's interesting. Um, there's been some, there's some debate about what's going on. And a lot of more study needs to be done on um, how that what that mechanism is, but there's some potential to harvest mechanical energy um, by just adding a piezoelectric material to your reaction. If we look at piezoelectric material, there's polymers. In fact, there's a there's a place in Pennsylvania. Uh, I think it's a spinoff of a state college called PolyK. They actually produce uh, PVDF um, films, which maybe sure like polyvinylene fluoride is also used in uh, chemical fittings. Um, but this uh, is has oriented dipoles. It's not a non-symmetric crystal, um, but it's a crystal and polymer that's flexible. So that's really great for doing measurements because we can flex it and not shatter the, uh, the sensing unit. Now, if we you ask what can we measure or what is going on when we apply force, well, the really nice thing here is there's a there's a relationship between the potential or voltage measured across the faces of a piezoelectric material and the force. So if we look at the equation of the upper left, uh, potential, or V naught, is equal to the force of the impact over the area. So force over area would be the pressure. Um, the thickness of the material, the thickness of the material, and the permittivity. And the D here is a, a constant uh, particular to the material. So various materials have different um, uh, mod uh, piezoelectric moduluses, and we can look those up on a table. Yeah, uh, PVDF is actually quite high, and, and uh, so that's quite useful for doing measurements with that. Now, materials, especially PVDF, can have different voltage responses dependent upon the application of force, and the way those are des designated is you, you have the XY, you actually have three, six ways to apply force. You have your XY linear forces, or you can actually have torsional forces that you can apply. And these are just given these numbers. So if we look at D33, we have the di the uh, material has been oriented in the Z direction, and the force is being applied in the Z direction. And this is actually how we are going to implement some sensing. We're going to 
pick the, the pulling direction, which is the orientation direction, and transmit force through it to measure the potential that occurs across the surface. Um, now, the interesting thing with PVDF is if we have a material like this, we'll get a really negative voltage, but if we have the material or we're applying force this way, we'll get a positive. So there could be a way to deconvolute different types of impacts occurring on the sensor. Now, just a little bit. Um, so if you want to apply mechanical energy and want to start measuring it, in my lab in the United States, we have specs uh, for coal Palmer vials are common, less so recently, and I think that's because of this purchase. Um, we have a lot of these, uh, they're standard vials, and what really makes them nice for this type of application is this little pocket here. So we can design vi uh, new vials with, that allows us to insert electronics into this pocket or completely replace the lid. And this pocket will protect any electronics from damage, and we can clamp right onto it. We don't have to worry about the electronic wiring or electronics getting crushed or, or banging into things. Um, but we do need to redesign it. So the standard vial, which is all steel, is not necessarily, well, it's, it's going to be difficult to measure any kind of electrical signal because it's just going to all go to ground. So we may see something, but we're not going to be able to measure. We want to measure. We don't want to just, we want to observe things through quantitatable measurements. Now, as a side, I'll give you a little bit of the page. We have an article on this. This There it does offer an opportunity to harvest the electrons produced to do work. Like I said, people have added piezoelectric materials to reactions. We've looked at, at, at adding uh, the, the harvesting the potential produced by the impact, but not actually having the piezoelectric material in, in, the, uh, in, the, reagent, in the reaction area. Um, I'm going to go over this a little bit. So we actually designed move some things here so I can see what I'm doing. This will look better in a second. Um, we had to redesign the vial, so we actually replaced the vial with uh, two lids. So instead of having just a top lid, we have a top and bottom lid. Uh, the bottom lid we usually just have as a flat piece of steel, so we don't really care about that. The body of the vial itself, we want to be insulating, so we use uh, peak as its most it's inert, fairly impact resistant. Um, <laughs> And fairly uh, abrasion resistant, and we have a uh, impact plate because we do not want to impact the media onto the circuit board itself, and a printed circuit board. Uh, if we look a little closer at what's going on, um, so I'll show you some of our. You know, it's nice to see science where you see the problems you had. It, everybody likes to tell a story where it's everything works great and things look. Wonderful, and you go and try to do it, and it doesn't work. Um, so this strike plate, it turned out, was quite critical. Um, we had originally picked a quite thin, which I thought at the time was a thick enough strike plate. It was thin. This attests to the amount of energy that is being imparted in just this simple little device um, that it the single ball bearing, half-inch ball bearing or 12-millimeter ball bearing, peened the flat disc into basically a cup. So we have a set of these look like castanets. So I keep them around because they look neat. But uh, when that bends, that flexes the circuit board and causes issues. Uh, we since moved to much thicker ones. And even those, um, this is a 400 series uh, hardened steel. Even them are quite not quite thick enough. So we're getting some deformation here. Um, our very first thought was instead of using PVDF, we would use a commercial uh, lead zirconate. So these are used in... Um, sonar systems to generate pulses for like submarines. Um, and if you look up piezoelectric materials, you see they're called like Navy type one, Navy type two, those were developed for sonar systems. So, and they're fairly expensive. Uh, the, the chunk, the, the disc that used to be in this image, uh, I think was about 15 US dollars uh, from a Florida company. But because of this flexing that you, you know, doesn't seem like much, ceramics are not great in, uh, they're great in compression, but not great in tension. And when you flex something, you're causing tension. And so we got severe damage to the ceramic. It just basically just shattered after one use. And at the same time, this peening caused the contact pad in the bottom to start spinning around. And you can see where it's spinning around, and we've tore, we ripped off our contact pad. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And what we did is we increased the what's called a pour, 
So these circuit boards are now made of thicker copper, so there's more to wear away. Um, and they're a little more resist, a little more resilient because the copper is malleable. Um, and we ended up in this design here. So if I want to, I'll show you the stack here. So we have our uh, peak uh, liner, so that our body, so that we can have electrically insulated top from the bottom. Uh, we have a striker plate that is now thick enough. The uh, pad that transfers the power, the power to the uh, the surface, the uh, the striker plate. Uh, our PVDF film, some electronics, I'm going to go into what those electronics are doing, and some spacer rings. The only way we could get this to survive was to actually pot it. So this is all epoxy together, so we cannot get that PVD film out anymore. Fortunately, it's very inexpensive, so we just cut circles of it. And this was, um, you'll see in the last slide, this was a, an interesting idea to make a vial where we could change the the charge on this plate, whether it be positive or negative charge, and this switch, this switch is not is not mechanically robust. It just falls apart. So the, here it's actually been soldered together, and I think it's uh, been, been soldered stuck as into uh, one mode. Now, this is a you can see we use this mill quite a bit. Uh, everybody's uh, well, I'd be, I guess I come from the solid state side, so our mills look uh, look crazy dirty because there's always a finite chance of a vial flying out and then uh, it makes a mess. Um, we have, you see the vial in place and our, we initially have silicone, which is not silicon, silicone wiring uh, going to a DAC and we found that there was severe electrical noise problems and it all came down, the major source of it was this little uh, cooling fan in the back was producing a lot of electrical noise. Now we didn't see it in the uh, low speed, we were doing low speed deck, we increased the uh, sampling rate, uh, we started seeing much uh, much more noise. So we ended up having to make put everything in a giant, in a Faraday shield. So the, the wires are all shielded, we have aluminum foil around the top of the electronics, and that did, we finally got it out, everything shielded out. Now you'll see my students' reaction when they got things uh, working. So shielding help, there's still some issues. Um, one might say, why not use uh, radio frequency? And well, if there's electrical noise, we're kind of worried about radio frequency interference. So we don't necessarily know. That might be something to look into. We do have space to build something in there, but it does add a level of complexity and perhaps some uh, lag. So our initial uh, work a while ago, we uh, did. A, we had one of these off-the-shelf little National Instrument USB. I mean, this, these are nice. You just plug in the USB. You can take some data. They got a fairly, because of the USB bus, they have a fairly slow sampling rate. You got 20 kilohertz. So if you look at an impact here, we have a one, two, three. We have three data points that are the impacts. We get no structure. We don't know what an impact looks like. We just say, oh, we see an impact. So <laughs> um, 20 kilohertz is not a high enough sampling rate to see what a uh, an impact looks like. Um, and so maybe looking at this data, we say 300 microseconds, maybe not. Um, you know, we really don't know if we're capturing entirely. Um, but if we do a fast Fourier analysis of this, we can actually see um, the balls moving around in the system. So this is a 12.7 or half inch millimeter ball in a vial, a specs vial moving back and forth. And now a specs vial moves in like a figure eight. And as it's doing that, that ball is not just going back and forth. So if you thought, if you look back at this presentation or go back to where you see the uh, form tech type vials or the retch type vials, you see the vials are going back and forth um, quite linearly. And it's pretty, you know, you can see what's going on in the motion of the ball. It's harder to predict the balls in the specs type. And so what we see is the fundamental shaking frequency here is 17.4 hertz. So we actually can measure the frequency of the uh, ball mill. And then you get resonances. So this is one, two, three, I believe. I gotta do the we'll do the math. And so the balls are actually moving around faster in the vial than this. They're bouncing. They're bouncing off the ends. Now we know it's not just the impact, but there's an impact and a bounce, an impact and a bounce. By directly measuring this, now any changes that we make inside there so we can make that we can change the inside geometry and say how does that change the resonance frequencies we see how does that change the impact duration we can start adding material now how does adding a solid uh, in there change the frequencies how much solid can we realistically add before we stop seeing any impacts 
So now we can, we're starting to get into a measurement. Unfortunately, a resolution is not uh, as great as where it should be. Um, and if we look at, you know, now we can start relating. So there's, you know, there's bringing the simulation back. Um, if you take the discrete element model, and this can predict a compressive force. If we have a predictive predicted compressive force, we can actually predict a, a uh, potential. Because if we know, we go back to the equation for phase electricity, we know that vo voltage is proportional to the incident force and the properties of the material. If we do that, we would expect to see in a uh, specs vial very high potentials or ne very negative potentials, depending upon what, you know, what sign you're looking at. Um, and we're not seeing that. So why is that? Um, is it that um, we're just not capturing it? Is it perhaps that we're, something is dissipating the energy? I'm kind of leaning more towards the dissipating uh, the energy. This is the ideal with zero resistance through everything. Um, and so one thought was that we the sampling rate was too slow. We're gonna I'm gonna show you where we attempted to solve that and we had some partial success. And the other is resistive losses, which we can minimize, but we cannot eliminate. Moving. So our first approach is we said, well, let's just let's just uh, get a better DAC. Let's do 200 kilohertz, which is not high speed by any stretch of the imagination. But remember the vial is only moving around to 17 hertz. So we're not looking. We want to measure a peak impact peak, but we don't necessarily need to do like a gigahertz sampling rate. Um, we had a bridge rectifier in there to potentially investigate some uh, some chemistry, and this actually shows the bridge rectifier is working. So we're it's it's uh, average getting rid of all the negatives, and we're getting only positive voltages. And this DAC is limited to 10 volts, and as you see, it just uh, um, cuts it off. And so that's that we were excited. So oh, we're seeing a you know, we're seeing much higher voltage, but we're like way higher than we saw with the 20 kilohertz. Um, and to get back to there is data there, but we have noise coming from the fan. So there is some information we can glean from this, but the, the shape of the peaks is not uh, is not that. If we do look at these, I'm sorry to go back here, if we look at this area here where the peak is cut off, um, we can bin that. We can say What's the duration of that cutoff? Let's say it's a we have a Gauss, a, you know, a Gaussian impact. Uh, then that is a section of that of that uh, peak, and it's somewhere up at you know, if it's very small, we're near the top of the peak. If it's very large, we're near the bottom of the peak. So we can look at the uh, the width where it's cut off. We can say, okay, if I have an empty vial, um, I get this distribution of impact durations, and if I have a, a vial full of water, which people do liquid assisted grinding. What does that do to the impact duration? You can see what it does is it ch severely it changes the impact duration to be much smaller, which is sort of indicative of reduced kinetic energy. So now we have a direct measurement of reducing the impact kinetic energy through the applicant to the addition of of mi a material of, of of let's say those reagents. Let's say we had thirty milliliters of reagent. We are doing a reaction. We now know we can now start measuring what's the force and the dura and the number of impacts we're getting as related to an empty one. So now we start going from the DEM type model uh, where it's all theoretical and we don't have any way to a, an empirical model that can then be cross-correlated to the discrete element model. And we actually got the noise under control and we can then look at, okay, we can look at, we can look at um, liquid filling, but what about solid filling? So it's very common we do mechanicals just do a solid-solid reaction. And you'll have these things called rule of thumb. So uh, mechanochemists or very earlier people that do mechanical alloying will do something called ball to powder ratio. Um, so you take the uh, mass of the balls and divide it by the mass of the, the powders or the powder divided by. You get a ratio of, uh, of your react, reactant to your milling media. And usually people do like 20 ma mass of mass, 20, 20 times the mass of the, the best of the balls are 20 times the mass of what you're milling. So if you want to mill like two grams of material, you'd want 10 to 20. So you'd want 20 to, to, um, to 10 grams of milling media in there. Well, what happens if you use, uh, if your ball to part ratio is way off? What if you would just had one ball and you just filled it up with your reactant? What does that do? Does that, you know, intuitively, you'd say if I filled my vial up with lots of powder, that ball is not going to move around. But what's the limit that that's going to happen at? And so we show here, if we take one half inch ball, this is looking at the Fourier transform. This is the frequency analysis. So 
the interesting thing at the higher resolution is we do again see these these uh, this resonance. So we see 17.4 hertz. We see the resonant frequencies, uh, but we also see a, another set of frequencies that tags along with it of something of moving slower. So there's a there's something going on with the motion of the ball where we're we're following the motion of the mill. The arm is going back and forth at 70 hertz, and the ball is but the ball is also bouncing, and we're getting a second set of frequencies. If we start loading sodium chloride, nice and safe for the students to use, they spill it, it's not so bad. Um, and we're just looking for filling. We're not caring right now about how tough or how abrasive something is. When we fill something 25%, which is quite high, so this is a 60, remember a 65 milliliter vial in here. So this is about nine grams of uh, sodium chloride, which is actually more sodium chloride than the mass of a single ball. The interesting thing is we can still see impacts. But you notice that the, the, the slower speed impacts have been damped out because now there's some powder in the way, getting in the way of the ball moving. If we fill it to 50%, which I would not have expected anything to happen, we get, you know, there's no impacts occurring because the ball now isn't trained in the solid and you're just like pushing solid around. Now that can lead to chemistry, that small solid, but we are not be able to measure those, those types of impacts uh, quite yet. So if we look at this Fourier transfer, we get interesting about the resonant, uh, about the motion of the balls. We can also start looking at the uh, impacts. Now this is getting a bit messy. So this is like some new data and we're, we're still trying to get the noise under control. Um, so we look at one half inch ball. This is the same experiment that we saw on the last page, except now we're looking at just the potential, okay? Now we're not getting the hundreds of volts that are predicted by discrete element modeling. Um, but you do, I want you to, a couple takeaways I want you to notice is if we look at the left red plot, the, um, the magnitude of the potential is higher than the right plot. You know, by, we got a maximum of like two volts, a little higher, or going down to a maximum of maybe, well, one and a half volts. So we've lost kinetic energy, and that's to be expected because we have a powder in the way. But now we have a relation. And actually, I'm, I'm a little surprised by this. I would have expected that kinetic energy with such a severe level of loading and the ball, uh, just a terrible ball to powder ratio, to be the kinetic energy be really pulled down to almost nothing, and it's not. There's still appreciable amounts of kinetic energy. This says to me that if you had a mild chemical reaction, you might be able to get it to go with such a degree of filling. And that actually bodes well if you're doing industrial scaling. That means when you want to scale such a process up to very large scale, you don't have to put a lot of energy in and you could put a lot of reagent in a reactor and expect to get good yields. So you know, the more the reagent you can put in a reactor and feed it through per hour, the more economically viable it is. The other interesting take home from this is that, and this, I guess, if you think about this, this makes sense. If we look at the, you see there's a repeating pattern. That's what we're seeing with the Fourier transform. Those are the impacts. So we get an impact and then it bounces and we get another impact. And they look generally the same shapes. So the impacts are looking very similar, but you see there's some variation because the ball is coming in at different angles. Um, it's not impacting at the exact same spot all the time. But the number of impacts per unit time, these are both the same these are both the same unit of time. These are both 0.3 seconds that we're looking at. The number of impacts increases with the uh, degree of filling. And why is that? You think it's slowing the ball down. Well, what I think it's doing is you filled up a quarter of the vial with solid. So now your free volume, think in terms of like stat max, your free volume for the ball is now smaller. So instead of being 65 milliliters, it's 65 milliliters minus the volume of the sodium chloride in there. So the ball, although the ball is free to move and it's losing a little kinetic energy traveling through that powder, it's moving through a smaller volume of material. So it, it's, we're getting higher frequency of uh, impacts. This has some interesting implications because although the impact energy has gone down, the frequency of impacts has gone up. So in terms of chemical yield, if your energy is, if your impact energy is enough to get the chemistry to occur, then you would actually want to have that high filling because the more impacts, if you think every impact is going to be some chemistry occurring, the more impacts you get per unit time is the more conversion you're going to get per unit time. Now, if you go to 50% filling, you can see absolutely, this is a milli, this is milli, by the way, it's a 10 to the negative three. There's, it's, it's overloaded. Nothing is moving around. So we're kind of excited about this. Well, kind of. Um, but then, you know, where can we apply this as well? So I have this little toy, and this is kind of what started this. I found this in a, uh, 
a, a unused storage area at the university across from my lab of all places. It just happened to be in a box. Um, this is a piezoelectric film that you flip, shake back and forth. You can see in the movie. And when you shake it, that bending of the piezoelectric film produces enough potential to cause a neon lamp to, uh, to be lit, to strike the neon lamp. The strike in the lamp, and it says here in the label, requires quite a high potential, 90 volts. So, you know, if you say, okay, we can measure things, and then also let's harvest that energy, that's 90 volts of, of, you know, now current has to do with the thickness of the film, but you'd have a lot of potential to, to literally and figuratively to, to push chemistry that uh, would be difficult to put that into just running wires into it. And you're harvesting some mechanical energy. So there's plenty of uh, potential to do chemistry. And we have shown, and there's a reference below here, um, that we can do, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not an interest, necessarily interesting chemistry. It's the reduction of um, methylene blue from uh, blue to white. But we can start looking at kinetics um, and chemical rate as a function of the amount of energy that's being harvested from the piezo electric material. I'd be very interested to look into if, if, if we, we were to look at a chemistry where redox chemistry would be enabled by this. What 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 redox chemistry could be could take advantage of this type of uh, heart energy harvest? Now, uh, I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, I would come to the end here. I kind of lost track of time, so I won't stay on time. Um, I wanted to give a little thanks to my group right now. I have. Uh, if you look at my group, it's actually a very diverse group. So I'm at the Florida Space Institute, and we are a center at the university. So I have students from all different types of, uh, I guess, majors. So we have biomedical science, to forensic science, to electrical engineering, to material science. Um, this is Christian Caprera and Jackie Olarchik. Um, they are undergrads that did the, actually, they did all the measurements. So, and uh, I, I think they sent me this image just to, as a joke, but I liked it because this uh, expresses how excited we were to finally get the noise under control um, and start actually uh, getting some data. I had to tell them, you know, this is this is the 90% uh, uh, preparation, and then we get 5% data taken, um, and then the 5% of the rest is some analysis. So uh, I would like to thank you for your time and uh, if if you have any information, you can always reach out. Thank you so much for your presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. First, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned using a single half inch ball bearing in your experiments with the strike plate. Have you run similar experiments with multiple smaller bearing balls? We have data for three eighths inch and quarter. I don't have the data in front of me, so we have run those. We've also done multiples. Uh, we plan on redoing those experiments with a higher speed. Uh, uh, data acquisition so we can actually see what the impacts look like. It's a good question because those impacts that we get right now look are not what I expected them to look like. Okay, thank you. Um, earlier on in your presentation, you were showing discrete element modeling and also discussed Hertz. Um, can you talk about how the effect of shear force is incorporated into that modeling or if it's incorporated and how much impact that might have? So the model does does allow you to extract out shear and normal forces um, where with this part what, what we're looking at is we're looking at mostly at compressive forces um, the shear is a good question so shear is very useful for delamination of 2d materials and there's some chemistry where shear is is like especially if you're in a screw extruder um, right now we are going for the low-hanging fruit which is looking at compressive forces a little easier I have some ideas on how to do shear where we might try to build a more complicated uh, system where we have piezoelectric centers in the wall. So that would allow us to see shear. But shear is very important, especially uh, for inducing some chemistries. Okay, uh, <clears throat> perhaps this is a related question then. Uh, the modeling was mostly related to elastic deformation. Do you know if there's any plastic deformation of the balls? For example, could you use microscopy to analyze any changes in the sphericity of the balls? There is, and there is a whole um, there is a whole um, group of researchers that actually look at that. I mean, I, unfortunately, I can't. I saw the presentation like years ago, 
Um, there are people that look at the impact of ball bearings on a surface at high speed and they and high speed microscopy and they can actually see the ball come in and slight deformation. Um, it has to deform, right? The coefficient of restitution is like 0.81. So there's definitely the ball is, uh, um, is deforming. We see macroscopically that over time, uh, the balls can get pitted or get off, off, uh, off round. Um, the absolute worst is to give aluminum oxide ball. It will actually wear non-uniformly because of the lattice structure. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Let's wrap up maybe on a general one. So it seems like you're getting some great results with these new tools. What, what's next and in the short term and long term for your um, for this project? I think what's next is we need to get this uh, we need to get, with any physical type chemistry measurement, we need more data. We need, we need more reproducible. We need to, uh, we need to understand there's a variability in the potential that we're seeing. We need to understand why uh, we're getting a variability in the potential. And then at that point, I really want to move into, we want to look at the uh, effect of liquid addition. So there's a, in mechanical chemistry, there's this thing called lag. And it's a little bit, there's some rule of thumb that you have a certain amount of water in the reaction procedure. I want to measure the um, impact and it forces as related to the degree of water loading or other solvents and see so that we can have this sort of uh, relationship that says, okay, if you have this type of, of viscosity in here, here's the kind of impacts you're gonna get. Awesome. All right, well, thank you again for your presentation. We appreciate you participating in the mechanochemistry discussions. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Blair, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. Just a reminder that all of our previous seminars are available to watch through the YouTube channel at Mechanochemistry Discussions, and we encourage you to check them out. Also, quick notes that we have some excellent speakers planned for the upcoming months in the seminar series, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Thank you again.